Evening, ladies and gents. It's Simon Brown here doing uh, the introduction for this evening's presentation. This evening's presentation, uh, Keith McLaughlin, who's from uh, Tebby Stockbroking. You also find him at smallcaps.coza, where he does a pretty much daily blog Monday to Friday. And we're taking on from the presentation we did a, a couple of weeks ago, where he looked at, at, at price earnings ratio, PE ratio, and really the thinking is here is to now delve into some practical. At the time, we asked folks to give us some suggestions, and, and, and the overwhelming choice was uh, for pick and pay. So we're going to take that, that, that knowledge we got from the price earnings uh, and really apply it into pick and pay in a practical example. I know Keith is going to say this, but I'm going to reiterate it nonetheless right up front. We're not giving you investment advice. We're doing a, a case study. We're, we're not rushing out there and saying good, bad, or ugly. This is a, a case study on one particular measure of value. So this is not to be construed as investment advice. With that, over to Keith. Hi guys, Th thanks for coming tonight. Uh, thanks Simon for the introduction. Uh, the, this is the fundamentals course. Uh, we, we're looking at equities and uh, last week we touched on the theory of price earnings. Um, this week we are doing the case study showing how the theory works. First of all, let's, let's do a little recap. Uh, if you remember in fundamentals, there's the four pillars of fundamentals. Uh, profitability, it's the aim of the business. Liquidity, cash is king. Solvency, we're looking at debt there, debt versus risk. You need the optimal level of gearing. And management, it's always a qualitative uh, part, of, uh, part of the business. In essentially, you're investing in people. And all of this is leading to a valuation and an investment decision. So those are the fundamentals, the four pillars. We had a look at, uh, at the basics of valuation. Um, there's a, the first start at the start is market ratios, the price earnings model. This is what we touched on the theory last week. Uh, there's price to book, dividend yield, price earnings growth, uh, the PEG model. There is actually a lot of market ratios. This is just uh, an example thereof. Uh, then we have absolute valuations. Now, the difference between relative and absolute is relative, we're tending to peg it to something. Absolute, we, we're actually valuing it in isolation. Two major absolute valuations is a discounted free cash flow model, the DCF model, and then the dividend discount model. Now, of the price earnings that we touched on in theory uh, last week or last month, there, there were four major price earnings benchmarks. From now on, I'm going to be talking about PE, not price earnings. Um, so four, four, other, four major PEs. You're measuring it against the market. On the JSE, this would be the ALZ. You're measuring it against the sector in which it's trading. Uh, for example, it's a technology stock. You measure it versus the technology index. Then you measure it against the single comparator, local, international, or whatever you think is the single closest comparator for them. And then you're actually measuring it against itself, against the history, the average price earnings, for example, over the last 10 years or wherever. Careful when you're doing this, though. Uh, you have to make sure the business hasn't changed. The business model itself hasn't changed over that period. But we will touch on this uh, tonight because this case study is um, on pick and pay. The share code is PRK. We're going to talk about pick and pay from now on. Uh, as a nutshell, before we even go into it, for those who are not familiar with pick and pay, and most people in South Africa would expect to be, is pick and pay is, is really a retailer of food, clothing, and general merchandise. Uh, it's got a market cap of 19.4 billion, um, and it's basically everywhere. Now, we will analyze Pick and Pay's investment case versus the price earnings model. Um, what I want to emphasize is that this is a case study. We are applying the price earnings model and only the price earnings model. The other valuations could be spitting out different things, and we will touch on that. There's, there's always a couple of contradictions between different valuations and different, different answers. Um, so this is only the price earnings model, and hence it will have shortcomings, but I'm here to demonstrate how the price earnings, how you should approach price earnings. Um, as Simon said, this is not investment advice, simply an educational case study. First obvious thing to check, uh, pick and pay against, is its historical trading data. It's been listed um, many, many, many years. Uh, as far back as I could find, um, I think it listed in 1991. So let's take its entire trading history, and that's what we've done here. Now, what this graph is showing us is the blue line is literally its day-to-day -day price earnings. 
The green line is the high point of those price earnings. The purple line, I think that's purple, is, is, is the low point of its price earnings. And more importantly, probably, is the red line is actually the average over the whole period. What you can see here, analyzing pick and pay versus his own data, his historical records, is where we're sitting now, right over there. Pick and pay is not only trading a way above its low, its uh, price earnings, it's trading way above its average. And in fact, it is right now at the highest price earnings it has ever been. That's worth thinking about. Um, it's trading near or at its all-time high, depending on the intraday, but let's, let's take, it, uh, take it as, as it comes. Um, just simply based on history, without looking at anything else, the conclusion can only be you're paying a lot for, the, for its profits. Because remember, the price earnings is the multiple of its profits you're paying to own that share. And at this point, you're paying the highest you've ever paid to own it. Hence, it appears overvalued versus its history. Now, let's compare it versus the market. Pick and pay versus the Aussie. The blue line is pick and pay. The red line is the Aussie. Now, just intuitively, looking at the graph without calculating or crunching any numbers, not only is pick and pay trading above the Aussie, but pick and pay appears always to trade above the Aussie's price earnings. So the market is a little bit more confident in maybe the sector or maybe the company. But uh, what can it tell us about this? Uh, well, first of all, we can say the obvious conclusion is that pick and pay is trading at a premium to the Aussie. But there's a better way to approach this. If it's always been trading at a premium, except maybe that point and that point, but we'll, and even that point, but we'll view those as outliers, the overlying trend here is that it is, does trade at a premium to the Aussie. Um, so what, there's a better way to approach this. The question is, isn't the relative valuation versus the Aussie. The question is what relative premium should you be paying for pick and pay? Um, so there's also the question of if pick and pay always trades at a premium, or is currently trading at a premium, why not just buy the rest of the market? It's cheaper. Food for thought. Now, what I've done in this graph, let me spend a little time explaining it, is I've taken the Aussie, I've taken pick and pay's price earnings, and I've divided it by the Aussie's price earnings. And what you reach is you reach a percentage. And that percentage is the premium that pick and pay trades at versus the Aussie on any given day or over any given period. And just like our previous historical analysis of pick and pay's price earnings, this one, we're analyzing the premium that it trades to the Aussie. So this is why it has percentage points down the side. More, point, more, more importantly, have a look at the green line. The green line is the, is the highest premium pick and pay has ever traded at versus the Aussie. Once again, the purple line is the low, lowest premium uh, pick and pay has ever traded to the Aussie. And in fact, at one point, it was at a discount, um, arguably two points. Then the red line, once again, probably the most important if you believe in mean, mean reversion, in, in other words, everything goes back to its average state of being, is that the red line is the average premium pick and pay trades to the Aussie. And there's one single conclusion we can take out of this. It's trading at the highest premium it's ever had to the Aussie. Historically, it trades at a premium of about 30, 36% higher price earnings than the Aussie trades at. Uh, it's currently trading at its highest range. The conclusion is simple. It, once again, appears overvalued. Now, pick and pay, what we're doing, we've compared it versus itself, the historical data. We have then compared it versus the whole market. That's the Aussie. Now, pick and pay, there's different parts of the market, and perhaps they're a little bit more relevant. Um, and in this case, pick and pay is a retailer. So what we're taking is we're taking its price earnings and we're comparing it versus the retailer index. If you remember, versus the Aussie, it trades at a very healthy premium. You can see that. Now, we jump forward to the retailer index. It's actually trading a lot more in line with that index. So perhaps our entire retail sector generally trades at a premium versus the Aussie. That's, once again, food for thought. Nothing to do with pick and pay. 
but uh, in this graph, it doesn't tell us too much other than, uh, you know, give or take, pick and pay's price earnings is, is quite correlated to the sector. Uh, it historically trades in line with the sector, and it's, it's current price earnings right over there. It's trading at a price earnings much higher than the sector. Now, if you remember with the Aussie, I took the discounts, and we actually charted the discounts and the premiums. We're going to do exactly the same thing here. Pick and pay versus the retail index. I've taken the pick and pay price earnings and divided it by the retail price earnings, and we get the premium or discount, the pick and pay trades versus the retail index's price earnings. Once again, blue is the, is the high point of the price earnings premium range, the, the purple is the low point, and the red is the average. What's a little bit more important in the analysis is that pick and pay is once again agreeing with all those, uh, those other two graphs uh, that we've looked at, the other two conclusions, is that pick and pay is not just trading above its average versus the retail index, it is actually trading at near its high. Historically trades at a premium. This is an interesting fact, uh, is that pick and pay historically trades at 11% premium versus the retail index. Now, remember the Aussie, it trades at a 36% premium uh, to the Aussie's price earnings. That implies that the rest of the retail sector generally trades at, uh, double check my math, sir, 25% premium, 25% premium versus the Aussie. Um, just an interesting fact, um, maybe guys in, picking, uh, guys in uh, South Africa just spend a lot of money. Uh, What's, what's important here is the conclusion is that it backs up everything we've touched on, where the pick and pay is trading at the high point of its premium, not just the premium versus the market, not just the premium versus itself, but premium versus other direct competitors and investable options. You could buy the retailers at um, that looks about like a 30%, 35% discount versus pick and pay right now. Currently at the high range of the premium, once again, it appears overvalued. Now, what I've done here, this is a little bit more of a complicated graph because peer comparisons, um, well, first of all, we compared pick and pay versus itself. That's the historical. We compared pick and pay versus the Aussie, that's the market. We compared pick and pay versus the index. Now, even within the index, there's comparatives that just aren't actually very good comparatives. Um, so what I've taken here is I've taken the three closest comparators, of, and there's no, there's no two businesses that are exactly the same, but there are ones that are closer. So I've taken pick and pay versus ShopRite and Spa, both very similar businesses, very similar market spaces. Yes, we can, we can debate the differences in, 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 in a range of factors, but these are the three closest listed comparators. Um, so let's just take it as, uh, as, as a truth and gossip rule in, in this case study so I can show you how you compare it directly versus peer comparisons. Now, the obvious one is historical price earnings. If you remember price earnings, uh, the historical ones, these are actually based on published historical numbers. They won't change. Um, well, the, the earnings won't change. The share will change and they'll change them. Where we're sitting at right now is that pick and pay being blue is trading at quite a much higher price earnings than either ShopRite, which is red, or SPA, that is green. Now, if you remember what I touched on is that the historic, the history of a company isn't as important as its future. What you're actually investing in is its future. So this is where we talk about forward price earnings. Now, if you remember, forward price earnings inherently has forecast risk because you could be wrong about those forward price earnings. They could, they could be too low or too high. That said, what I've taken is I've taken the Arnett, Arnett Bridge Broker Consensus of everybody who covers pick and pay and submits their, their forecasts, all gets averaged, and we arrive at, a, at what they call a broker's consensus. So I've taken each of these companies, pick and pay, ShopRite and Spa, and I've broken them down, and I'm looking at the next 12 months earnings in them. And this is a very important point because you will see there's another graph here called calendrized. Now, none of these companies share the same financial year end. So what I've taken is simply the FY12, financial year 12, and it's called the financial year 
because the last month in that uh, financial year ends in 2012. And I've simply taken the FY12 results and comparing them on forward price earnings. It'll be current share price divided by FY12 earnings per share. Once again, we can see pick and pay is trading at a much higher price earnings, much higher forward price earnings to shop right on spot. Now the final, final point, I'm not going to linger on this, but I need to touch on it because they all have different year ends. There's a concept called calendarized forward price earnings. Because none of them share the same year end, theoretically, when I'm looking comparing their forward price earnings, I'm not comparing like versus like. So what I've done is I've simply equalized both ShopRite and SPA to pick and pay's next 12 month earnings period. It includes a little bit of arithmetic. You know, you're stripping out months and putting in other months and things like that. Um, if you need more technical detail, there's there's always Google. There isn't really time in this webinar to touch on it, but I need to mention it so that you are aware that if you're comparing like versus like, you should actually calendarize things. But what's more interesting is that they all agree with themselves. Even on a calendarized basis, pick and pay is trading at a higher price earnings. It just pick and pay appears expensive based on the historical based on the forward and based on the calendar last price earnings directly versus peers, it appears overvalued. So the conclusion, remember this conclusion is based only on price earnings analysis, is that pick and pay appears overvalued, but the market, like we are not taking into account some fundamental factors. This is why you need to know the companies you're chatting about and the companies you're analyzing, the companies you're investing in, is because there are always fundamental circumstances that can differ quite markedly. The first one is that pick and pay is actually currently in, it would hate me to call it a turnaround, but it actually is a turnaround. Um, second of all, it, it's just exited Australia at a yeah, there's short-term costs, there's, there's been some distortion in historical earnings. Australia was an absolute disaster, went into it, and it's still in the process of exiting it. Short-term costs impact short-term profits, not necessarily long-term. And then finally, we're not taking into account dividends of pick and pay, strategic assets, different business models. Like a SPA, as a good example, actually runs what is more a franchise or orientated model, whereas pick and pay tends to be uh, like tends to own its stores that it operates through. So there's, there's fundamental differences in the business models that actually do influence the market ratios. That said, we've purely on a price earnings basis, it appears overvalued. What you need to do is take into account all these extra facts to arrive at a fully uh, uh, educated opinion on pick and pay. And that's where our other models come into play. But we will touch on that in, in, in future webinars. So, oh, so there was, sorry, there was one last point where we are comparing it versus the sector and uh, maybe just the entire retail sectors of a value. I mean, the, the retail, so I, I don't know what you think, but uh, the entire retail sector trading a historical, and we're talking about nearly a 20-year historical 11% premium price earnings to the Aussie. That feels a bit pricey. Shop right just hit an all-time high today. So uh, perhaps just the entire sector is overvalued. Um, hence, this is not a conclusive opinion, but I hope I've showed you the, the, the way to approach price earnings analysis. Guys, open to questions. Uh, folks, if you've got any questions, uh, throw them in the, in the question box. Otherwise, if you've got a mic attached, you can uh, raise your hand. We'll try and get two headsets working here so we can both hear it. Uh, a point that came through from Helen, and she says, sure, so 25% premium to Aussie historically. Um, so, sorry, it was retail. 36 and, and, and Helen, the point is correct, is that different sectors, and, and banks were typically from, and I haven't crunched the numbers, but last time I did, Banks typically tr uh, trade at, at levels below the, the Aussie or lower price earnings below the Aussie. And certainly from this evidence, uh, retailers trade at a, at a higher one. A question coming through from David. He wants to flip it around. He says, okay, so if everything was positive about the pick and pay PE, 
you would still stand back and say, let's go do that extra work. David, short answer, yes. Cool, I like them coming short and sweet. Um, another question coming through is that it is, uh, sorry, I didn't write down who the question came from, um, that it's very much a, a sense of, of, of putting it all together. It absolutely can't be in isolation. And the question is, is, is that true of other models we look at, that there's no one model which you can use in isolation. You always need that blend. Absolutely. Um, the more models you work through, the more uh, conviction you have that your call is right. That said, as you work through different companies, you'll start to appreciate that some models will tend to will, will tend to be more appropriate for each company. But that said, if if you didn't work through the other models and didn't approach maybe conflicting opinions, you might not have realized that you made a mistake somewhere and actually made a wrong call. So what you're doing is not just necessarily confirming yourself, you're double checking yourself. Okay, and a question from Andrew, and I think he was watching the uh, Adrian Seville webinar on, on value investing. He says, not so much maybe pick and pay, but certainly you're more volatiles like Billiton, which are a little more sort of boom and bustish, not really, but a little bit more. Would it be worth also perhaps looking at what uh, the Canon guys call through the cycle? I was taking a, a seven-year earnings versus, versus current price and, and scrolling that back to try and smooth out some of the, the volatility of earnings just because of commodity prices and currencies in the case of bulletin and the like. Absolutely. That's 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 very uh, very useful approach. It's quite quick and dirty, but it can give you a very nice answer. But it is also long term oriented. You have to understand that. That's not tradable. The mean reversion takes a while to get there. Um, that said, I mean sorry, for everybody's benefit, let me let me um, uh, offer another approach to price earnings. You can use a historical basis but then what you apply it to is not current earnings. Current earnings can be distorted by the economic cycle. So what you do is you, you work out an average ROE across the cycle, across the cycle, and you apply that to the current NAV, the current shareholder's equity, to arrive at a normalized profit. Apply that normalized profit to your average historical price earnings, and you're reaching a mean fair value. It's not to say it's a fair value right now, but it's to say it's a fair value, it will approach as the cycle goes up or down. Um, so it's very much an, a, a, a useful approach, especially for cyclical companies like Burton. For pick and pay, not so much. Um, you know, retailers are not overly cyclical. What they tend to be is in and out of fashion for investment, but not necessarily in and out of fashion for, uh, for operations. One thing you must be careful of, if you apply that approach, is that you have to make sure that the period you, you're using is, is really through the cycle and not just the top of it or the bottom of it. So you have to have sufficient historical data, probably 7 to 10, maybe 20, if possible, you know, a million years would be the best. But, but more importantly than even the period you use, make sure that the business model, the business itself, has not changed over that period. Because if it has, the returns will change and your answer will be wrong. Okay, we've got a question coming through from um, Tim Leng. He's saying, if you take all the companies under one sector, so retail or whatever the case may be, and you evaluate their PE to the Aussie, can one, con con can one conclude the company with the lowest premium is a good buy and ignore the other models? Interesting question. Um, first of all, you have to be uh, careful of sector bias. A sector bias can imply that uh, the whole sector itself is, is overvalued or undervalued. If you're assuming that it isn't, um, then what, what is probably a good double check to this approach is just go and actually do some fundamental research on the company. Why is it actually trading at a discount? Now, there's, there's, I'm a small and mid-cap uh, specialist uh, on the JSE, but there's guys who are retail specialists. There's guys who are resource specialists, and they generally tend to direct the, the flow, and they, they have their best picks and, and their worst picks. And if a, if a company in a highly liquid sector is trading at a massive discount to its peers, there's normally a pretty good reason why. 
Yeah, there's always a good reason somewhere. Uh, Frank makes a comment that uh, headline earnings per share for PIC versus forecasts uh, was actually down three times in the last four years, as much as 13% down. Not good outlook for the last four years. Uh, Frank, 100%. Pick and pay is almost the telcom of the retail sector, although actually that's mean and nasty. I take that back. <laughs> we, won't, we won't call pick and pay the telcom. They're having a tough time, not as tough as telcom. Uh, ladies and gents, we're going to leave it there. Questions are done, and uh, we almost hit our time limit. Uh, as always, my, my thanks to Keith McClarkson. I certainly enjoyed that. That made a that made a heck lot of sense to me, and I think widened how I use pick, uh, uh, price earnings. I usually identify a stock I like and then wait for price earnings to get in the range. Um, this gave me more, perhaps, to look at in the future. Uh, Keith's got a quick last point. Guys, final point is um, price earnings is a useful, quick and dirty method, but it is not the be-all and end-all of everything. In other words, it's not the holy grail. I know. Still searching. We'll find it one day. Ladies and gents, we'll leave it there. My huge thanks for you all attending. Um, you can follow Keith on Twitter at Keith McLachlan. You can follow me at Simon PB and, of course, at Just One Lap to find us. Thanks very much. Cheers.